Levi, by contrast, comes close to rendering sacred the world of play. A spirit of, I don't know what to call it, moderate hedonism pervades his writings. Although he praised very highly the intense camaraderie of work, which he loved, he seemed to see us at our most human when we're simply enjoying ourselves. In play, he said, we find again the savour of childhood, delicate and forgotten. Play is like receiving free of charge or almost a rare and beautiful object. More, the substantially non-verbal civilization of play, he said, crosses political frontiers with the happy freedom of the wind and the clouds. He loved the mountains and later the valleys through which he would walk with the great political philosopher Niberto Bobbio, amusing Bobbio with jokes and witticisms, pointing out the marvels of the natural world. But Levy also loved the pavement, which he said was a civilized institution full of surprises, which I love. He enjoyed the poetry of chess, a game at which he said he was rubbish, but played in a dreamy and festive spirit. He could be wondrously impressed by the instantaneous and prodigious leap of the flea, about which he wrote an entire essay. <laughs> he wrote another one about the beauty of the butterfly, and he recalled with reverence the moment when a butterfly called Anantioba with its brownish purple wings landed on the hand of Hermann Hesse before departing again in a great warm light. He really noticed things, did Primo Levi. More than that, he kind of noticed them twice, or rather he noticed the same thing under two optics. His aesthetic or artistic enjoyment of, for instance, the vivacity of birds was not lessened but kind of doubled by his scientific appreciation that this explosion of colour amongst birds is an obligatory solution to the problem of survival. Perhaps no writer has better bridged the, twin, the two cultures of the sciences and the humanities. Um, Levy smelt the flowers of the social world too and kind of enchants the everyday worlds we live in for us. In one essay, for instance, he describes his deep feelings for the house in which he'd spent his entire life, bar that year in Auschwitz and a brief stay in Milan. It was a very plain house, according to Levy, he called it a machine for living. But by directing our memory to the living, he kind of enchants the machine. Listen to him describe a nondescript little space in his house. The next corner between the wall and the walnut closet was coveted as a hiding place where we played hide and seek. I had hidden there on some unspecified Sunday and knelt down on a sliver of glass and still bear the scar on my left knee. Thirty years after me, my daughter hid there, but she laughed and was found immediately. And after another eight years, my son, with a flock of his friends, one of whom lost a baby tooth in that very spot, and for mysterious, magical reasons, shoved into a hole in the plaster where it probably still is. Levy invites us, I think, to find the mystery and the magic and the joy in the small things. Now, family, which is, of course is a very big thing, lived as a series of very small things, was extremely important to Levy. His mother Esther lived with him and his wife, and he cared for his mother Esther even when those duties oppressed him. He writes quite beautifully about family. He writes about a childhood memory of a day spent with his grandfather, who had a store selling fabrics on the old Via Roma. At carnival time, he would invite all the grandchildren to watch the procession of allegorical floats from the store's balcony. And Levy, in an essay, simply closes his eyes and recalls the view. This is what he writes. At the time, Via Roma was paved with delightful wooden tiles on which the iron hooves of the draft horses did not slip and along which ran the tracks of an electric trolley. It's like a prose poem, as much of Levy's precise, astringent writing is. So Levy does not extend an invitation to a happy, shiny future. Nietzsche's Superman is not here. Instead, he suggests to us that if we turn our eyes away from those shiny futures and towards the delightful wooden tiles on the Via Roma and the company of our family and friends, we might be better off. Anyway, that's the invitation I read Levy as extending to us. So by conclusion, Levy died on the 11th of April, 1987. He probably committed suicide by throwing himself down the stairwell of his building. Others point out how low the rail was and suggest it could have been an accident. This writer left no suicide note. It's a complicated story beyond the scope of this talk. But I would like to say this by way of a last word. Um, Levy praised a novel by Manzoni, The Betrothed, one of his favourites. And what did he love about it? It was, he said, sure, rich, 
with a strong and sad human wisdom which enriches you and which you feel is valid for all time. Many have found and continue to find those qualities in Levy's writing too. Primo is gone, but his books remain a living presence. Thank you.